My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari. In this episode, we do nomadic warfare. Nomadic warfare is probably the most documented part of the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. And the reason why is because occasionally throughout history, nomads run into settled societies and settled societies write about how traumatic that event was for them. That's the Huns destroying the Roman Empire. That's the Mongols destroying, well, most of the civilizations of Asia. That's the story of the Great Plains, the Sioux, the Comanche, the Apache, you know, cowboys and Indians. The story settled people have about nomadic warfare is how unrelentingly violent it is. So we have to talk about why. Why would it be that way? Why would the Mongols kill 5% of humanity? What could possibly be the reason for that? And the answer is that nomads are competing with other nomadic tribes for scarce food resources. If I don't eat it, somebody else will. And if they eat it, I might starve. And so small tribes fight over food resources. There's a book that came out a couple years ago about, oh, we should never have become settled and civilized. We should have always been nomadic. You could find all the food you needed in 20 minutes of work. Yeah. If you were in the right place at the right time and nobody else ever showed up. And you never had to move, which you did all the time. Because if the food doesn't run out, the poop will force you to move sooner or later. And so... It's like this, this, this dream book that forgets that there's fierce competition. That these people are murdering each other all the time. Why, why isn't that in history? Why don't we have books about it? Well, we do. But the thing is, is that nomads don't write stuff down. So we don't have the hitch history of the Apache murdering the Comanche, murdering the small feet, murdering the crow, murdering the... That's all in oral history, and let's be honest, settled peoples don't really care about nomadic oral history. They didn't care about it 5,000 years ago. They didn't care about it in 1500. They didn't care about it in the 1800s. They don't care about it now. So our little picture, if you're watching the video, is that which does not kill me should run. And that is effectively the attitude of nomadic warfare. All men are warriors. They are professional warriors. All men fight. And they fight all the time. So they're good at fighting. This is the thing that you have to remember. When you fight nomads, settled peoples lose because they're not good at fighting. They're farmers. While nomads fight all the time. Why? Why are they fighting all the time? Because they're at war all the time. They're at war against nature. That's what hunting is. Animals don't want to be turned into food. Think about the war, the, the weapons of war. The spear and the bow. Those are hunting weapons first. So you're at war against nature. And you're at war against other people. Mostly nomads. But later, settled people. Because nomads need food. 
and either they're coming into conflict with people like them who are nomadic, also looking for food, or later on, they're going to run into settled people who never leave, who stay where they are, and who grow food, who have food. And so if you're desperate, and you know there's going to be a fight, and you're desperate, you can go after the settled people and take their food. Women could also use these weapons. They could use the spear. They could use the bow. See Amazons. Amazonian women were famous for their use of bows, and it's thought that they came out of the idea of the Scythian horse nomadic women who shot bows. What was the purpose of nomadic warfare? Well, it's not about land. Remember, we don't own land. There's no boundaries. There's no, this is mine, you could have that. So it's the liquidation of competition. You kill the men, you absorb the women, you enslave and incorporate the children. That's what you do. You wipe out other peoples. Why? Because they're competing with you for the food. If they eat the food first, you might starve. So what you do is you kill them and then they don't eat the food. It's very simple. Why do you kill the men? Well, because they're men. They're kind of useless to your group. You can never trust them to be loyal. And so you murder them. That's pretty much how it goes. The story of Genghis Khan starts here where his tribe was wiped out. He was left for dead. His wife absconded with, his wife kidnapped. This is how the Huns work. They just obliterate places. Obliterate armies. Because they're, they're not uh, worried about land and ownership and money. They don't have any of these things. All the things settled people would want to keep people alive for. No, 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 no. It's the exact opposite. They're in competition with every other human being on earth for food. So you kill the men. So you absorb the women. Okay. What does that mean? Well, you incorporate the women into your tribe. You don't murder the women if you can help it. Why? Well, one, women are laborers. And they are higher end laborers than the men are, right? The, the food they collect is worth more to the survival of the group. The second thing is women have children. Now, my students will always say, oh, well, that's the reason. It's reproduction. But that's not the reason because I can't show up to my wife and say, hey, honey, look at what I just captured, another wife. She's not going to like that very much, right? Especially since, like, She's the wife. So it's not about reproduction. It's about the opposite, the other end of the spectrum. It's about death. The most dangerous thing a woman will ever do in this class is give birth to a child. Nobody understands science. Nobody understands reproduction at all. People didn't understand reproduction in the 20th century. People don't understand reproduction now. There's still people who are um, pregnant and wondering how the baby's going to come out of the, the belly button. Like, uh, it's not. There are, you give birth in the dirt. And if any of you have ever had children, it is not the cleanest of events. All of the goo that's inside comes out. And if stuff can come out, stuff can get in. Especially with people in their hands and they're touching. Nobody understands germs. 
And so you get what in the 18th century you would have called, the British called childbed fever. You give birth to a child, and even if that goes completely normal, great. Three days later, you have a fever. A day or two after that, you're hallucinating. A day after that, you're dead. Because you got sepsis, you got infected, you got a blood infection, and it just burns right through your body. It goes right through. And so women died all the time from natural life, from the hardness of life, and from especially from giving children. Every time you had a child, you were rolling the dice because, great, if the baby comes out head first, you're probably okay as long as you don't get an infection, which, since nobody understands how the infections happen, is hard to prevent. But what if the baby comes out butt first, feet first, shoulder first? There's no way, there's no anesthesia to... If they cut out the baby, they're killing you. They're killing the woman, the mother, just from the pain of doing that. They don't understand surgery at all. Um, no, it's very likely the child and the woman are going to die. And this is still true today. It is, in America, in 2020, safer for a black woman to give birth in many sub-Saharan African countries than to give birth in a hospital in New Jersey. It happened to Serena Williams. She almost died after giving birth to her child because the doctors wouldn't listen to her. And that had a lot to do with gender. It had a lot to do with race. It had a lot to do with class. It had a lot to do with the fact women die in America. It has to do with the healthcare system. And that's with all of our scientific knowledge. It's still safer in other places. And so you absorb the women because women die all the time. And so there's probably widowers who might have kids who need a wife. And so they get a wife. Now, is what happens next rape? Yes. Yes. By any modern definition, it's rape. They, these women are going to end up having sex with a man they do not want to have sex with. Maybe it's violent. Maybe it's not. But it is they are having sex with a person they did not want to have sex with. In fact, the person they liked having sex with is dead. And so, what does this mean? Well, it is, by any modern definition, rape. But these women are also going to be absorbed into the tribe as citizens, as full members, with full rights. They are part of the system. They will work. Their children will be legitimate. They can move up the social hierarchy. And if not them, certainly their children can. And so there is a bonus to this. Life continues. They are not enslaved to be used as pleasure. Well, what about children? Will you enslave and incorporate the children? Why? Because children die at a horrific rate, maybe as high as 50% by the age of five. Even in the Greek world, if you wanted to have two children to live to adulthood, you basically had to have eight to 10 children. So women were baby factories just to get a child to the next generation. Someone who could take care of you in your old age. If in fact you live to be old. And so there's a constant need of children because children constantly die. The second thing is children do work adults don't want to do. If 
if you've ever had an older brother or a sister, you know this. They they they'll be playing their video game and they'll be like, uh, you know, little bro, can you go get me a coke? And you'll say okay, and you'll go off and you'll do it, and you're used as basically free labor. Children, so I come home from hunting. Does my horse need to be taken care of? Yes. Watered, fed, sure. But I don't want to be doing that. I want to go hang out in the meeting hall, talking with the other men, flirting with some of the women, telling them about the deer I almost killed, or I did kill, that now needs to be dressed and butchered. I don't have time for my horse, but my horse needs to be taken care of. Perfect job for a kid. 8, 10, 11 year old. Take the horse. Thank you, son. I'm going to go into the tribal hut. Talk with the chief, the other people around. You take care of my horse. That's great. So what the children get out of this? One, they get incorporated. Yes, they get treated badly. They get treated as workers to do jobs no adults don't want to do. That's inefficient for adults to be doing. Yes. But also, they grow up. If they live, they will grow up. And if they grow up, they're going to be incorporated into the tribe as adults. So how do we do this? Well, the obvious way is marriage. I have a daughter, or I have two daughters, right? I'm, I'm a mover and shaker in the tribe, so I want my eldest daughter to be married to someone in the tribe who's important. But I got this second daughter... And I got this boy who's been, I've enslaved from back in the day. He's now grown up. He's now 15, 16 years old. He can probably murder me in my sleep. Easy. He's probably had lots of opportunities to do so. There's no doors on anything. There's no locks. He hasn't done that. So to show him, to incorporate him in, to continue to use his labor as part of the tribe, but to bind him to the tribe, I'll marry him to my daughter. They'll get married. Their kids will be my grandchildren. He'll fight for the tribe. He'll hunt for the tribe. We as, we absorbed him in as part of the culture. I continue to get his labor as my son-in-law. The tribe continues to get his labor as a hunter and a warrior. And so... You get this incorporation. They are enslaved for their labor, but they're then incorporated as adults because you can't keep young men, a large number of young men as slaves. They'll murder you in your sleep. And so the Huns, the Mongols, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, what these guys do, because of their method of warfare, they scare settled people. St. John, John the Evangelist, John the Beloved, right? John of Patmos went to, went to a beautiful Greek island to write about the end of the world, to get away from everyone, to smoke some really good drugs, uh, and hashtag, that's perfectly cool. In like almost every ancient religion, drugs were a part of it. Whether it's hashish, opium, wine, drugs are a major component of getting you in the frame of mind, in the, in the ability to see this other world. So while we have a kind of post-Christian, post-Reformation um, hatred for mind-altering substances. In the ancient world, in the pre-ancient world, they were very important to understanding the gods. The gods did not live on Earth. They lived in a plane set off from Earth. And so... You kind of had to do the things that got your brain tuning in to that that alternate dimension. 
And so he goes to Patmos. So St. John goes to Patmos. Beautiful island. Starts writing about the end of the world. And who does he foresee bringing the end of the world? He's a Roman. And yet what he foresees as bringing the end of the world is nomadic horse people. Not armies. Not the serried ranks of the, of the Persians of the East. Not the barbarian uh, swordsmen of the forests and axemen of the forest of the north. No. The horsemen of the steppe. So ingrained is this fear that settled people have. The Romans didn't know any horse people. They had all been beaten up and civilized. There, Yeah, the Parthians are out there in the east. All right. You know, the Scythians are somewhere up in Russia, Ukraine. But there is much rumor as they are anything else. Like the Battle of Cari, where Crassus is defeated by the Parthians and their, their horsemen and their unending bows, was 150 years before John of Patmos' writing. There weren't any Huns, any Mongols. On the horizon. Eastern civilization. Forced barbarians. Those were the people to be worried about. And yet that's not what John picks. He picks the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Men on horse. Nomadic men on horse. That's what scared him. That's what scared settled people. Armies we can deal with. Barbarians I can fight. But horse people, they scared. They move too fast. They hit too hard. And their warfare was uncivilized. Because they didn't care who lived and who died. They were perfectly willing to murder everybody. And then they kidnap your wife and take your kids. Maybe. And so nomadic warfare becomes the kind of entrenched fear settled people have of what the apocalypse, what the end of the world will look like. Now, what we'll see is the horse changes everything. The domestication of the horse somewhere around 10,000 BC changes everything. The first is it allows you more wealth than if you walked around. It's the difference between a backpack and your car. Your car can carry a lot more stuff. Many of you grew up with DVDs, games, Nintendo Switches. In the back, you, you could throw your entire weekend and take a weekend trip, all your clothes for a weekend. You can go. So suddenly, more survivability, because the horse could carry much more than you could on your own. So this is especially important for cheese, portable protein, right? Um, this is important for... Berries and nuts and high high caloric value in a low weight foods. So you got more survivability. It gave you a strategic advantage, and that was speed. The horse can go much farther and much longer than people can without getting tired. And so you were able to cover more distance, which meant that you could find more food. If you went into a valley and there wasn't any food, you could get out of that valley, go to and find a new valley before the winters came in, before the snows came and wiped it all away. You could get out of the mountains in a way people who were walking couldn't. You could survive mistakes if you had the horse. That walking peoples, people who did not domesticate the horse, couldn't survive. It also gave you a tactical advantage, and that was gravity and momentum. In battle, you were way better off. You're eight feet in the air. So every time you stabbed down, you swung down, you had gravity on your side. So you not only had the strength of your body, you had physics helping you kill your enemy. You had momentum on your side. When you shoot that bow, you are moving at 20 miles an hour. So that is added to its Striking power to its to its penetration power. And so it gave you an advantage in battle. And so what we see 
in Euro Europe and Asia, what we see in the Eurasian landmass is this complete change over who lives where. Whereas everybody walked all over the place when they were Homo erectus or, or Neanderthals and, or Denisovans or even Homo sapiens, where they walked, the, the domestication of the horse changed where people lived because the horse nomads dominated the steppe. And the steppe is this highway, this grass highway that goes from northern China all the way straight across Eurasia into Hungary and the Ukraine, Ukraine and Hungary. It is a great grass steppe. It is Wyoming, but 8,000 miles of it. High plateau, cold in the winter, hot in the summer, but perfect for feeding horses, for moving fast. What does that do? Well, if you're not a horse domesticating people, if you do not figure out how to domesticate the horse, which is not a simple thing to do, you got wiped out or you moved and you moved into harder zones to live in. To get out of the way of the horse nomads, you moved into places like river valleys into mountain zones like Tibet, into forests like Northern Europe. You moved to places that was harder for the horse peoples to go. You could survive there, but it was hard to survive in the marshes of river valleys that might flood. You don't know what food is there, what grows there. could be just weeds. The forests are even less dense. Because they're more dense. So you get more nuts and the such. Maybe more game to eat. But at the same time, much harder to find all that stuff. So you get this separation of horse peoples from non-horse peoples. Horse peoples will dominate for the next 10,000 years. Until basically the 1800s. At least into the 1500s. But as long as the 1800s in some places will dominate this sphere, the Ukraine to Ch northern China steppe, S-T-E-P-P-E. -P -P -E. While non-horse peoples get pushed into harder to live places, river valleys, mountains and forests. Okay, in our next episode, we will talk about government and the law. Thank you. Thank you.